Um, so, and there was a whole bunch of dialogue, and there were, in the context there was a story, a joke, which he tells. And I have no idea what possessed me, but, because uh, uh, I knew that w what happens, you have an actor saying a line, and then the AD says the line, the AD says, and I said to him, I, 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 I like this, you're getting absolutely nothing from this guy. <laughs> So I said, that's a waste of time. I'm not going to worry about that. I walked out there, and somebody, to announce to everybody who was there, somebody says, to Brian Dennehy, no agent. <laughs> 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 oh, that's, believe me, that was, that was that, that's nothing compared to what normally happens, OK? And I walked out, and I said to the AD, he says, no, I'll take care of this. And the AD kind of looked at me, as, and I said, and so just as George McBrain, the Northern Irish comedian, I just started. I took my wife to the zoo. I was walking around the zoo, and we see this pit, this big, deep pit. I look down to the pit, and the orangutan is in there. The fucking orangutan. <laughs> big old, big red hair sticking out of him. And he's looking, he's got the big red ass, you know, like that. <laughs> We're looking down, and then she says, oh, George, Jesus, look at, the, look at that thing. Look at that fellow, look at his ass on him. He says, I know, look at him, he's amazing, isn't he? And with that, she leans way over, and she falls into the pit. She falls down into the pit. And meanwhile, everybody's in the audience is beginning to sit up. And he says, and the big fella, he goes, something's wrong. Something's, something's changed in my pit. Something's <laughs> changed in my pit. And he looks across, and there she is, on the other side of the pit. Her dress is up. Her big white arse is sticking up in the air. <laughs> and the big fella goes like this. He starts to lumber across the thing, pink door. He starts to move towards it. And with that, the thing in the middle of his legs comes up. <laughs> Bright red orange it was. And he comes across and she says, George, George, God help me. Save me, George, save me. And I says, tell him you got a headache. <laughs> So, and, uh, and, long, and so with that, <laughs> I turned and walked off the stage. And a friend of mine, Chris McCarran, I still remember, he was an Irishman. And Chris had finished. He was waiting for him. We are going to get a cup of coffee. We're both, we walk out, the door slams shut, and we're walking down. And Chris says, Jesus, that was, that was good. I said, yeah, yeah. Right. We get halfway down the alleyway, and the door pops open. And it's the assistant casting director saying, Brian, can you come back this afternoon? And I can still remember the sensation I felt. I turned around, I looked at Chris, and I looked at her, and I knew everything was different. Everything had changed. That afternoon, I went, I read for Mike Nichols and Trevor Griffiths. And uh, I did pretty much what I just did. I didn't bother with the dialogue. I just told the story. And Trevor Griffiths laughed out loud. He's the guy who wrote the book, the play. I could hear him laughing all the way down. And they introduced him. Alex Cohn, the producer, was obviously, for him to be there, some, they realized that something had happened. And I'll never forget it. Trevor, uh, Mike Nichols walked all the way down the aisle, because they were all in the back of the house. And he looks up at me, and he looks at me, and he says, where did you come from? <laughs> like that. And I said, well, I, I guess I should take that as indeed praise from Caesar, <laughs> which, of course, is a, an old Shakespearean reference. And he looked at me, and he smiled. He says, yes, you should. <laughs> so everything was different after that. So sometimes you take the dice, and you throw them the way you want to throw them. And I did that day. And I can still remember that day. And that's over 30 years ago. And it made a huge difference in my life. Since then, have you let that kind of feeling govern you on other occasions? I'm going to just do it the way I see it? Well, almost any time you do a play, there are occasions where you, I mean, you are trying to play a part. You are trying, you, are, you, are, you, you have the responsibility of of uh, performing what the author wants you to perform. But every once in a while, the author will give you the opportunity, as Trevor did with that character, 
who is essentially just telling a joke, it'll give you an opportunity as an actor to take that paragraph and just blow it up and just make it sing. And I knew that that existed in there. And the point is that ultimately an actor's responsibility is to do that, is to take words and make them into moments of fun or power or emotional understanding or rationalization that would not otherwise exist. You could read those lines and just read them and nothing would happen. But if you not only play them, but inhabit them and enjoy them and dance with them, that's something else. And that's what, that's what your responsibility as an actor is. Now, the fair question to ask is why did that happen to me at that particular moment? Because as a result of it, as a result of that moment, that decision, and this is what's so peculiar about it, everything changed. Because it becomes one of those apocryphal moments that I'm sure, you know, Nichols has told the story, and I'm sure Trevor Griffiths, has, both of them became friends of mine. And, uh, uh, so you then say, what, what, how could you do that? How would you take that chance? Why would you do it? And I have no answer to that. I have no answer to that question. All I knew was, it, this is the time, this is the place. Stand back and let me go. And uh, it changed everything. You know, it's interesting, shortly after that, you, you started to get a lot of your breaks in the movies and getting parts, and I was looking back over a lot of the early stuff I first ever saw you in, and you were given parts that on paper probably looked like the conventional villain or heavy. You know, I'm thinking of things like in, in First Blood, which was the movie that started the whole Rambo series, you were the sheriff who... I like, don't accept responsibility for that. No. <laughs> but you were Only the for the first one, which no. was a good movie. You were the sheriff who stood up to Stallone, and it was kind of... On paper, it didn't seem like that much of a character, but everybody remembered you. What, did, like, what made you give that, bring, give that guy such The reason life? why people remember that movie is because a lot of people went to it. Yeah. What happens in the movies is you can, be a lot of, you can be sensational in movies, but if nobody sees it, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, and that was true for a lot of pictures. Ten, for example, where I played a bartender, uh, uh, just a friendly bartender to, uh, to Dudley Moore, was a picture that everybody saw. And, and First Blood was a picture everybody saw. And you, know, and, yeah. and you, had, you, know, you had, this, uh, had this combat with, uh, with Sly. It was a funny bit about that picture. We shot it in Vancouver in November, which is, they were, and it's all exteriors, right? That was good thinking. You get the sun about 10 in the morning, lose about 3 in the afternoon. <laughs> that was really helpful. Plus the rain and the snow and the big high trees. I mean, that picture took forever to shoot. But what happened was that... Uh, he was supposed to die at the end of that picture, which a lot of people don't. The original script and three or four versions of the script, the one was supposed to be killed. Actually, at one point, he was going to kill himself with the help of Richard Crenna, uh, <laughs> who was his boy, the colonel. And <laughs> about halfway through the picture, when they began to really see the dailies, especially down in, in, uh, in Hollywood, Los Angeles, uh, a decision was made that had to change the picture because not only was Stallone not going to die, but they were going to make a franchise out of this. <laughs> and uh, so all of a sudden it had to be rewritten at the ending. And, uh, but that's the way it happens you know, a lot in the movies. And of course it became, it was funny, Richard Crenna was the one who benefited, benefited more than anyone out of that because Stallone, of course, was the star. But the fact is, the Friday before we started shooting on Monday, Kirk Douglas was in Vancouver to play that part, to play the part of the colonel, the, the, uh, the Special Forces colonel. And Kirk was under the misapprehension that the movie was to be about him. <laughs> <laughs> and Ted Kotcheff, who's from Montreal, a wonderful director, kept saying to him, it's going to be about you, it's going to be about you, it's fine. <laughs> And then finally, I think Kirk realized that this was not going to be about him, and if it was not going to be about him, he didn't want any part of it, and he got on a plane and he left. Now, we had to start shooting on Monday, okay? This was not some big Hollywood production. This was a, 
This was an independent production with a very limited amount of money. So Ted gets on the phone to call people up who hadn't even read the script, knew nothing about it. The first guy he calls was Bill Devane. And Bill Devane, in his wisdom, turned it down. <laughs> called somebody else. And then the third guy he called was Richard Crenna. And Richard Crenna was one of, one of the world's nicest human beings and a great guy, a great sense of humor. Ted says, I'm going to get you a script. There'll be a script at your place. And Richard Crenna says, I don't need a script. Forget about it. Just tell me a little bit about it. And he was on a plane the next day. And Crenna made six of them, I think. Six of those movies. Put all of his kids through college, bought himself a big house. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, those are the things you think about when you're making those movies. <laughs> Something I, I've never raised you in all the time we've talked together is probably, I guess, the baddest bad guy in some ways you ever played was John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy. But I and uh, and when you were first asked to do it, did you ever hesitate about playing someone that horrible? No, not really. I mean, it's a part. It's, uh, it's funny. Uh, those guys are easy to play because instead of, you know, playing him with the drool coming down out of his mouth and the crazy eyes, because John Wayne Gacy was a real person who lived a real life in a suburb of Chicago and was married and had kids and a mother, and a father who just happened to kill a minimum of probably 50 young boys, 33 of which he buried in his crawl space. But he was not the kind of guy that you would look at and you'd say, oh my God, this guy's a mass murderer. Most serial killers are not. And so the simple thing, and, and the choice that everybody always marvels at, is, my God, he's just like us, just like you and me. It's funny, I had this conversation with Hopkins after he did, uh, I, now his was a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he said the same thing. The thing is just to, you know, one of the greatest choices you can make as an actor in a movie is not to blink. Just never blink. Just look and never blink. And the audience finds that fascinating. My God, that guy's such a great actor. Look at that. <laughs> not even blinking. <laughs> but anyway, um, those parts are always a lot easier to play than than you think they are. What's the toughest kind of part to play? The toughest kind of part to play is the guy, a person who is normal, but there's something else going on. I mean, if you want to see, I use this example a lot. If you want to see a very, very high level of film acting, now I happen to be in the picture, but I'm not talking about myself in the movie. There's a picture called Gorky Park, which is a really good movie. But do yourself a favor, if you're interested in this subject that I'm talking about, and there's no reason why you should be, but which is in response to your question. That's the hardest thing to do. Yeah. Watch Bill Hurt's performance in that movie. I mean, what he does, and, and Michael Apted, who directed, was smart enough to put the camera in close on Bill. And he's pre presented in the movie with a big dilemma. If he succeeds in doing what needs to be done and what he's supposed to, to do, he will destroy his life. Because he's, he's working for the government, he's a cop, and yet the KGB is in back of this, and he knows the KGB is in, in back of this, so that if he finds the real guys who are guilty of this in, in that era, Russia, he's finished. And he knows that, and he does that anyway. But you can see the dilemma in his face at every minute. Another movie, same actor, Accidental Tourist. A beautiful, beautiful movie. And the pain that's etched in his face because of the death of his son. So that's what I mean by being able to play a normal person confronted with unusual circumstances who's not foaming at the mouth and not raving and not crying, just showing in his face, in his eyes, in the tiny wrinkles of his forehead, the difficulty and the agony and the problems of life. That's what great film acting is. And he is a great film actor. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of them. Gene Hackman is another one, right at the top of the list. Um, so you were, you, you were talking about... I don't include myself no. in any of those categories. 
You were talking about a lot of times people know you best for a movie because, or they say they like you best because it was a movie everybody saw. But there's also some good pictures you've made that that weren't as popular. Nobody saw. <laughs> yeah, and you have. What's your favorite among many those? of those? If you could, if you could drop the screen now and show us all one movie starring you that you wanted us to see, what would it be that we probably hadn't seen? You know, one of the problems with answering that question is a lot of them I haven't seen either. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things about being in them, you don't have to look at them. So, um, well, one you thought we'd I don't like. know. I think probably the one that where I had the hardest job to do, and I think it worked out pretty good, was a picture called Belly of an Architect, which, again, nobody... Oh. And nobody really needs to see it, but, but it's, it's, um, it's a guy who's filled with frustration uh, about everything, and can there be anything worse in life? And this was the, 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 the dilemma that Greenaway described. And it's a very interesting problem for an actor like myself. Is there anything more difficult in life than knowing, understanding what greatness is, what great art is? Being able to see it, being able to realize it, being able to look at it and touch it and feel it, and not being able to do it. And that's the dilemma that Cracklight has in Belly of an Architect his pain comes out of his awareness of, and his frustration, his longing to, to, to express to other people, even just to express to other people what it is, what it can be, how important it is, how significant it is, how moving it can be. How, and, and other people just wander around uncaringly. You know, it's, there's a wonderful scene that's, that's uh, shot in, uh, actually got to shoot inside, um, the uh, the great dome, Hadrian's mm -hmm. and a dome in uh, Rome, the largest dome in the world, two thousand years old. And he understands what it means. He understand. He sees it. He can feel it. And of course, the Romans are just going by, you know, flipping cigarettes out and spitting on the sidewalk and completely unaware of it. The picture is about that. About a man who sees it, feels it, understands it can't do it, number one, and number two, can't even communicate it. Can't even make other people feel how significant it is, how important it is. What was Greenway like to work for? It was funny, he's a very austere person. He never shows any emotion. Very uh, hugely intelligent, of course, a painter himself, which is why if you see certain of those uh, shots, you'll see a, a big shot, and you'll see just a huge chiaroscuro of, of swirling color and objects and so forth in the background. All natural, nothing forced, nothing faked, but it's like a painting. And a beautiful, beautiful film with beautiful music and pretty good performances. He himself had a, a problem with actors. He had a, always had a problem with actors until he... He and I worked together. And, I, and I, said to, I said to him right from the beginning, I have no idea what you're trying to do in this picture, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take whatever you say, or whatever you've written, what, what he would do, I'll, I'll go around the other way with this. He would take hours in the morning to set up a shot, four or five hours. And then he would call you in and it was all going to be shot with a huge frame. He would never shoot close-ups. He would never give you a chance to do a performance in close-up. And he would give you these elaborate directions. I want you to move over here, pick up the magazine, look at the magazine, hold it this way so the light hits it here, say the first two lines. Just turn your face slightly so we can pick it up here. Put the magazine down. Now move over here, pick up the socks and the shoes. And you would, he would have these geometric directions. It was all going to be done in one. Now, in prior years, in prior movies, actors, good actors, because he worked with good actors, said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> I can't do that. That's not the way I work. And because I knew that Greenaway was doing something that I had no experience with, and I had no uh, 
I, I, you know, it was all daunting to me. The script was daunting. The beautiful settings that we were in Rome were daunting. I, I never said no to him, ever. I would always say the same thing. I need five minutes. I need 10 minutes. And then the AD, one of the ADs, would hold the script and all these elaborate directions that I had from him. And we'd walk through it three or four times, three or four times. Give me one more time, walk through it. And then we'd shoot. And uh, so within two or three weeks, because I would always try to put some kind of life into it, some kind of emotional. It wasn't just a question of doing the movements. You had to invest it with some life, some energy, which I would do, because that was my job. And within two or three weeks, he and I were on such a wavelength. He would actually say to me, I want you to do this, 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 and then I want you to do what you do, whatever it is. <laughs> and it's an interesting picture. It's a, a picture I still watch, and I say, I don't exactly know what the hell is going on here. But I remember having, having one scene on a bed when Cracklight is having some kind of uh, episode, and Peter was reaching for something, and I, and I said to him, you mean like St. Teresa of Avila, you know that famous thing where she's in this agony? And he said, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so then this big, fat, bearded Irishman does Teresa of Avila on his <laughs> But those experiences don't happen very often. That was an extraordinary experience. We had a wonderful time. We got no release in the States. It was too bad. It was at the Cannes Film Festival. And uh, we all went there and had a great time, but it was never really released in the stage. 